Recently, PBS or the History Channel, uh, one of the more educational sources of media, uh, produced a documentary on Benjamin Franklin. It was a two-part series, four hours long. I recorded it and then went back and watched it last week. And while much of the information was familiar to me, uh, because I've been a fan of history and of certain uh, historical characters, and certainly a fan of biographies, that this certainly struck my interest. And uh, I did not remember how important the role was that he played in the American Revolution, that he was the one who essentially brokered the relationship with France that supplied us with the support for the finances uh, that we needed to actually win that war. And, uh, and Franklin is an intriguing character. Um, I, I know that I have, over the years of doing ministry, when it came time to do a memorial service for somebody looking for famous epitaphs, and, and his was one of the more famous ones, and we actually have the notes, uh, his handwritten note of what he was hoping it would be uh, when the time came in his life. In 1728, at the age of 22, this is what he wrote. The body of B. Franklin, printer. Like the cover of an old book, its contents torn out, and the script of its lettering, the, the strip of, its, of the, its lettering, gilding, lies here, food for worms. But the work shall not be wholly lost, for it will, as he believed, appear once more in a new and more perfect edition, corrected and amended by the author. I know that, that Franklin believed in his mind that he was going to get to walk on the streets of gold, or whatever his view of heaven actually was. And by and large, he was a relatively good man, but whether he made it on those streets of gold, we do not. It is highly suspect, because there's never any evidence of his claiming a profession of faith in Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, his belief in the Creator, which was embodied in the, the document of the Constitution, the Declaration, uh, those things is, is evidence because he did believe those things. But, you know, the question is, is that enough to get a person into heaven? Uh, if, if you're like I am, then you know that there's no evidence in Scripture for that to actually be the case. Because when you go back and read the history as this documentary presented, that he had some serious character slash moral flaws. As a matter of fact, I found it sort of interesting, uh, poetic, ironic, that as I was looking for a portrait of his to include in this introduction, and I did the normal Google query thing, Benjamin Franklin portrait, I get, a whole, this, I get this whole page that pops up of all of these options of portraits of Benjamin Franklin, except for this one right here. <laughs> it, is, it is a portrait of Jennifer Lopez. Now, I've kept it in small size because it's not really for general public consumption. Because that was one of the flaws in his character and his morality. He was a lover of women. You know, I, I thought about this sort of as a backdrop to, um, to our ongoing study in the seven churches, the book of Revelations. I confess to you now that I did not really realize... Uh, what I was biting off in proceeding to do this. I was operating on the premise that we would simply walk through this, look at these descriptions of these seven churches that were real churches that existed in Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. So, so this we, these were letters that, that John was directed to write by Jesus himself as he appeared in his glory there at the beginning of the book. So, so these were real letters written to real people in real churches in real locations. And, um, and because there were seven of those, and I thought, well, we can, we can identify some, perhaps some challenges or some issues that exist in churches that, that somewhat fall under the judgment of God. That, you know, how else do we account for the fact that churches come and go and, and they don't have an, an enduring history? or they fall on lean times or hard times, or they simply go away other than the blessings of the Spirit of God have been lifted from them. And so I admit this was really more than, because it's been a long time since I even read about these seven churches. But because of our commitment to do this, then we have so enjoined our study together. 
And we've come to the fourth. This is really the halfway point in all these churches, three before and three after. And uh, so I wanted to take a, a little bit different approach. We could do this with all of these, but I'm, I'm simply entitling today's study an ecclesiastical differential. This is from verses 18 through 29 of chapter 2. Ecclesiastical simply means church, for those of you who are not aware. Differential is a medical term. It is what um, doctors do when they're trying to diagnose a condition of a patient they're attempting to treat. And because that is my sense of call of ministry in this season of my life to come alongside of churches, that will allow me to do that then that's in effect what we are trying to do with them. Identify the issues within that body that account for why they're in the state or the condition that they are in. Hence the title, An Ecclesiastical Differential. So follow along as, as, as we make our way through this and try to honor our time together. Uh, that a, a, An ecclesiastical dif differential is best achieved from the outside or maybe better stated from the upside. Verse 18 of chapter 2 reads, And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, The Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet are like burnished bronze, says this. Now every one of the churches uh, is introduced somewhat like this. The person speaking are giving the directive to John to write these things, so that it is, it is made clear that John is not the source of this information. As a matter of fact, one of the early mistakes by Bible translators, that you see this especially in the older uh, copies of the King James, in, in the, the title of this last book in the New Testament and of the Bible was the Revelation of St. John, which was a misnomer because this wasn't a revelation of St. John. It was a revelation to him, but it was not his revelation. It was a revelation of Jesus Christ. And so it's important to point this out as a part of a differential process. An examination is better achieved by somebody who's on the outside looking in. And I think maybe that's one of the reasons that each one of these letters is so introduced, that this is not an inside job. It explains why I have read years ago, um, because I'm a fan of biographies, that family and friends make very poor biographers. Because they, have a, they tend to have a bias that they want to paint the best possible picture or portrait of, of someone that they know and care about. And so they make very poor biographers. Uh, a couple of cases, I, I read the unauthorized biography of Rush Limbaugh back when it came out in the early 90s. He hated it. But you know, I found it a very honest and truthful, and it gave me an appreciation of him that otherwise I might not have had. Or Kitty Kelly's biography of, of, of Ronald Reagan. Um, you know, they, they, the Reagans hated this book, but I found it a very honest representation. So a, an ecclesiastical differential is best achieved from the outside or the upside. And it's why family and friends don't make good biographers. It's why fin financial audits for institutions or organizations can't be internal. <laughs> this is one of the problems that, that churches especially are guilty of because for-profit businesses are under much more stringent uh, guidelines than are not-for-profit businesses. And so a for-profit business uh, goes out of their way to make sure that they have clean books unless they you know, have a, cr a criminal intent. And churches, because you know, they want to believe the best about everyone, um, when it comes to doing an audit of, of their books to make sure that everything is as it should, most of the time churches will simply do an internal audit. Um, th that is not the best way to go about doing it. I know from personal experience that that's not the best case. To have an honest appraisal or an assessment of the financial health and processes of an entity, it needs to be external. It, it should not be internal. Uh, when it's on the inside, there's, there's a tendency to turn a blind eye to things that may be suspect, but you don't have any hard evidence, so you don't raise the question. And finally, it's, it's, it's why doctors, as a rule, there are obvious exceptions, shouldn't treat themselves. 
you know, doctors, they go through medical school, they go through the training, through an internship, they, you know, they know the diseases, they know the symptoms, they know the treatments. If they don't know the treatments, they have a physician's desk reference that they can pull off and, and look at these things. And, and a smart doctor knows, not, you know, if, if he's not feeling well, go to a friend. I mean, that's a pretty tight circle of friends that they guard each other's clinical practices and they look out after each other. And to go to a friend and say, okay, you know, I, I'm not feeling well, then would you diagnose me so that I get the proper treatment? The doctors that don't do that are the doctors who become addicts to their own prescriptions. And, and it's easy to see why that happens. So when it comes to a differential, and in this case, a differential about a church, a church that, a, a healthy church, you know, nobody ever asks the question, what's wrong here? They celebrate the fact that it's going well. It's like, I don't know about you this, this past weekend, uh, Resurrection Sunday, um, known to, to many of us as, that this was the first Sunday that was really, truly post-pandemic that it was a little over two years ago when everything went into lockdown and, and churches, you know, didn't open. Most of them didn't open for at least two months. And then they came back in online at various rates and paces and times and circumstances. And so this was the first true post-pandemic where if you see a mask on somebody, it's extremely rare. And, and the church that we attend, while, you know, God has blessed it. When, when they reopened after COVID, after two months, they were one of the few churches that in-person worship, they did have social distancing in there, but masks were not mandated. You didn't have to wear a mask. And that was a huge draw for people. The, the fact that there were families that were looking for an in-person worship experience. It didn't matter how well somebody could do it online. It just didn't measure up to an in-person experience. And so the churches like the one that we're a part of, the Somerville Baptist Church, um, you know, they did online stuff, but they, they so people began to, 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 to flow in there and flow in there. And they experienced a, a, a huge growth spurt during this season. And giving has been off the charts for them. <laughs> and God bless them. I'm, I'm happy for them. You know, the, the pastor is a good friend of mine. The, you know, the staff making friends with those. And, you know, we found a, a, a niche there when I'm not serving someplace else. And so they didn't really know. They knew they were going to have a big day this past Sunday. So this is a church at their worship center. I'm going to say seats roughly, you know, 800 people. And they were doing two services and the place has been reasonably full and they're trying to, you know, figure out where to go from there. Sunday, there were 2,000 people showed up, <laughs> squeezed into three services. The second service, they couldn't get everybody in the building. They had to meet in, in, in extra rooms and hallways and watch it on, on monitors. A, a, a church that's going well, they don't, they, they, nobody would step back and say, what's wrong here? <laughs> that you just celebrate that fact. But, but their churches, not every church experienced that because not every church is a healthy church church. And for the church, and we're talking about the people in, in those places and in those relationships, when they look around and realize it's not as it used to be, or it's certainly not as it should be, how do we account for that? And unfortunately, many of them try to do an internal audit and figure it out. That's one of the reasons that some of us go through training and equipping to come alongside of churches as an outside set of eyes to come in and to do an assessment and evaluation to see what they're doing or not doing and how they're doing it, to be objective and providing them feedback and input. And that's a part of what I feel called to do in this season of my life. Now, they're not, people are not lining up for my services because most, most churches that are struggling, uh, honestly, most of them don't want to know the truth. They want to believe that somehow it's going to just automatically turn around because they love Jesus and they love singing and they love preaching and somehow if they just keep doing what they always did, it's going to turn around. The second thing is that ecclesiastical um, differential doesn't overlook the positive. You know, it's one of the things I think that people are afraid of is that if somebody comes in from the outside to put their eyes on them, that it's going to be all bad. Well, let's look at, at verse 19 and we read these words. I know your deeds and your love and faith and service and perseverance and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. It's interesting. This is really the MO to all of these churches that Jesus says to them, it's not all bad. 
you know, this, this is, everything isn't just a critique. It's simply an objective observation. So let's start with what you have done right. Let's start with what you do well. Let's begin there so that you know that this isn't just automatically throwing rocks at you because of some shortcoming and failure. Let, let's look at what you have done right. And, and, and it breaks really down along a couple of different lines. One number, one number one is that spiritual health isn't accidental. When he says, I know your deeds, some translations are works. And he talks about your love, your fidelity, your charity, your faith, that cornerstone, that bedrock of what it means to know God and to live for Him. Your service, that is your ministry, your perseverance, that you, you continue to hang on and hang on and hang on. You're to be commended for that. So, so that spiritual health isn't accidental. That stuff doesn't just happen. It's because you are intentional in that part of your spiritual life and journey, both individually but then collectively as a church. Those were your hallmarks. Those were the things that, that you did right and you did well. You were engaged. You were gracious. You, you walked in faith. You, you, you held out. You, you persevered. And the second thing, that, that spiritual health you know, was never intended to be static. And, and even this was recognized by Jesus of this church at Thyatira. He says, I, I know your deeds. And then he says, and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. You know, one, one of the signs of a church that's on mission, really the purpose that God has called it to, is that they continue to grow and expand as, as they see opportunity. As they walk in faith, as they do those things that are, are, are at least encouraged by Scripture, if not mandated by Scripture, in what it means to be a church, to be a fellowship of saints and a group of believers that are on mission, to be salt and light to their community and to the world at large, that... If they're, if they're really who they're supposed to be and doing what they're supposed to do, then down the road, those attributes, so those qualities, so those commendable traits should be greater than they were at the very beginning. Because there should be that recognition that God is willing to do more if we're willing to simply let Him work through us, not get in the way to embrace a, a larger vision a broader spectrum of opportunity to give ourselves more fully to that because He wants to do more through us than we can even imagine. And, and it's true both of the church and of the individual. The, a, a church as a, as, a, as a group of people that are sharing a spiritual journey in a place and a time is never going to rise any higher than these truths about the individuals within that church. Spiritual health of individuals is never accidental. It's intentional. Praying and reading the Word and studying and fellowship and worshiping and sharing the gospel. Uh, never being satisfied with who you are or what you know or what you've achieved. Knowing that there's always more that God wants to do with you and through you. And that one year down the road from your commitment of faith to Jesus Christ. Five years down the road, ten years down the road. Uh, you know, there's, there are very few things that are, are more disconcerting that have known somebody across the spectrum of decades who is a true believer. They're, they're engaged in their church. They're there every week. They're serving. They're doing those kind of things. But when you see them 10 years down the road or 20 years down the road and 30 years down the road, they're, they're sharing exactly the same testimony they shared back then as though God has done nothing new in their lives. <laughs> it's, it's almost like that, that, uh, that experience of when you've been out of high school for a long time. For some of us, it's been a really long time. Matter of fact, this year is 50 years since I graduated from high school. Now, now I haven't seen anybody from my graduating class in 50 years because I just spent one year at that school and, and moved after that and haven't been back. But there are some people I've been curious about. But, but you, know, you know how it goes. Those people that, that do the, the reunions, you grew up and went to the same school for a lifetime and had the same sort of, uh, group of friends. And that when you go back and see them after 20 years or 30 years, what do they want to do? They want to reminisce about high school as though they're stuck in that season of their lives. Shouldn't be true of a church either. So in, a, in an ecclesiastical differential, it, it doesn't overlook the positive. When, when you know, you're asking the Lord through the eyes of somebody who wants to come alongside as a counselor to look in, it, it's not all bad. They're going to look at the things and commend you for the things that you do well. The third thing is that the differential must be unflinching. Unflinching. All right, let's, let's read this, beginning in verse 20. 
But, but, <laughs> anytime there's a but in the passage, you know that what comes is not really what you want to hear. But you need to hear it, and you have to hear it if things are going to change. But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and she teaches and leads my bondservants astray, so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, and she does not want to repent of her immorality. Behold, I will throw her on the bed of sickness, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of her deeds. And I will kill her children with pestilence, and all the churches will know that I am He who searches the minds and heart, and I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. <laughs> what do you do with that? This is the second time in this, this sequence of churches where Jesus, through his messenger John, is, is drawing on a character from, from the Old Testament. You know, last time it was, it was Balaam that he drew from. And, and, and to use that in context for them, and, and the challenge was, you know, what were the implications of that? And when I come and read this one, I'm going, my soul. You know, if you're going to do a, in a but in the middle of an evaluating a church, out of all the biblical characters you could choose, I'm not sure <laughs> you could have picked uh, a worse one than Jezebel. Nothing good is ever said about Jezebel. She's an Old Testament character. She lived in the time of the prophets. She was married to Ahab. Um, and she was a wicked queen. And she was the one who controlled the throne. He was a weak king when it came to his household. His wife literally wore the pants in the family. And if he wanted to do anything good, it wasn't going to happen because her heart and soul were bent on evil. That she hated the prophets of God, the true prophets of God, and she always elevated the prophets of Balaam. And, and it, never, it never worked out well for her. And, and she came to a, you know, under the prophecy, uh, one, of the, one of the prophets was that she came to a very hideous kind of death. She got thrown from a window and run over by a chariot and eaten by dogs as a part of the sentence of, of God's judgment upon her. So when, when we come to read this, uh, these words to the church at Thyatira, and Jesus said, you know, there's some things you're, you, you did well. I commend you for this and this and this and this. And, and later on, it was better than that early on. But I have this. You have a Jezebel among you. So what, what are we supposed to make of, of that? Um, well, I, I, started, I th thought we might do well to step back and, and provide you sort of a couple of different takes that, that scholars have done, uh, theologians have done, commentators have done. On, on the book of Revelation in general and on this, this section about the churches, per, perhaps the, the most high profile and popular is what's known as a dispensational approach. Dispensationalism is a, is a view of Scripture that, that breaks things down pretty systematically. There's a belief that human history uh, is spread over seven distinctive you know, seasons of time uh, from creation at the beginning all the way through. And that when you come to this prophecy in the book of Revelation, that these seven churches represent seven periods of church history from the time of the birth of the church in the book of Acts until the coming of Jesus Christ. And, and it's a, you know, a very neat and clean way of looking at it. And so I'm, I'm going to you know, just sort of share this with you. The, the seven seasons and periods break down like this. There is the church at Ephesus we looked at. This, this is considered the apostolic church that existed from about 33 A.D. to roughly 100 A.D., which is right just shortly after the time when John had this vision and, and was on the Isle of Patmos and wrote these letters. 
The second uh, season of church history was the church at Smyrna. We looked at them. This was the era of, of persecution under the ten Caesars. This was about A.D. 100 to A.D. Um, 312, when there were ten distinctive persecutions of the church. The third was the church at Pergamum, our examination last week. This was the era of a church-state union beginning at A.D. 312 through A.D. 590. This is primarily recognized as the birth of, of the church at Rome that, that came into being really uh, when, the, when the church and state were merged under Constantine, when he professed a belief in, in Jesus and saw the sign of the cross. And, and so he, he, made, he made Christianity the state religion, and it was out of that that the church of Rome was birthed you know, roughly a hundred years later. And so this was the season of the church-state union when through church history, there, there was no separation of those. The, the ecclesiastical power was the same as the civil power. And they were, if they were not identical, they were married at the hip. And so the dispensational approach would say, well, then this, this church of Pergamum represents that season. And then the church of Thyatira is the era spanning the, the, the Middle Ages, or, or some are more accurately described as the Dark Ages. Um, it's it's when, when ignorance reigned rampant in, in the ancient world. And, and the church was through this period when it was off the hook. There were the, the main church. Now, they're, they're all, I'm, I'm convinced there were always groups of believers around, around Europe that held to the truth of the gospel and weren't swept up into the corruption, but by and large... The face of the church in that season of time was, was not good. It was unholy. It was wretched. And so the church at Thyatira that we're looking at is a description of that. And so the, the reference to Jezebel is a reference to the state of the, the church during that period. And then there was the church at Sardis that we will look at uh, next week. And that was the, 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 the dispensational belief that was the season of the Protestant Reformation under Luther and and Zwingli and, and Calvin and some others from, from about A.D. 1517 to A.D. 1750. Then the Church of Philadelphia, the era of revival and great awakening that we saw take place in the 18th and the 19th century from about 1750 to 1925. And then the last church is the church at Laodicea, the era of, of higher criticism, which is about uh, A.D. 1900, until whenever the tribulation comes in or Jesus comes back, the church at Laodicea. And, and so the dispensationalists say, well, this is how we understand these churches and these texts and these words. And so when it comes to, to talking about Jezebel, then it was really the state of the church during that season of the history of the church. Now, I understand that this was the, the, what I was taught to believe growing up, and, and I'm okay if, if that's the position you want to take and that's how you want to read this. I, I don't have any objections to that. It, it works out very neatly and cleanly if you're a student of church history. It, it, it looks like that. But then I'm, the question I'm left asking was that these were words of Jesus, dictated through John, written to seven churches that existed where they were. And if this is a prophecy about church through human history from that time up until now or when Jesus comes back, then what was the word to that church at that time that was a relevant word? In, in every context of Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, in, in the words of prophecy, there was always a word in context to the people who heard it or read it. In addition to that which would come you know, down the road, uh, yet to be revealed or unfolded in, in, in God's providential time. And so for me, I'm not satisfied just to say, okay, well, we can write that off as it's that sort of a description of the, the immorality of the church and, and the idolatry that existed in the church during this season. Um, you know, it was true, but I'm not satisfied with that. So that leads me to what sort of a garden variety approach. And if, and if you go back and read commentators, you'll see they're all over the map with this because they have the same struggle I have with, with how do you wrap your mind around the reference of Jezebel and her practices to this church um, in first century Christianity. A garden variety approach. And here were the questions that came up as a result of this. Is, is Jezebel the pastor's wife? There's some scholars who believe that that's, that's actually the case, that the bishop of the church at Thyatira, that this is an allusion to his, his wife. Now, 
it, it's, that's not embraced by most scholars, but I'm thinking, well, that's a, that really is an interesting take because I know of circumstances where the pastor really wasn't the pastor of a church. His wife wasn't just the first lady. She was the queen bee. And so the church was really driven by her. She was the power behind the throne, so to speak. So was that possibly the problem that existed at Thyatira that, that led to these, this, this critical take on her that would draw on Jezebel as, as this wicked queen and to say, well, you know, this church, a, a church wasn't intended to be run by the pastor's wife, but the person leading the church was supposed to be what the pastor the one called and gifted to equip the saints to do the, to the, do the work of ministry. Uh, you've got to decide for yourself. Or is Jezebel symbolic of maternal church leadership? Those of us that have been in ministry for any length of time know that there are fraternal churches and then there are maternal churches. Fraternal churches are, are, are the more typical among evangelicals where, where, where the men among them were the strong leaders. They were the one at the, you know, the top of the food chain. I don't mean anything uh, derogatory toward women in that context, but by and, rule, by, by and large, they believe that that's the view of Scripture, that, that, that men were appointed by God to hold those positions of leadership. Women weren't second-class citizens, but they were gifted and called to do something uniquely different that, that they were really designed for and served for. And so the question that some ask is, is the, is the allusion to Jezebel in this very unflattering description of her uh, symbolic of, of a maternal church where, where the men have abdicated their responsibility. Because whether you know or not, if, if you're willing, women are glad to take charge. And sometimes they'll do a pretty good job. They'll do better than weak men. But is that really what God's design and pattern is? You have to decide for yourself, is this allusion to this wicked queen of the past in the framework of this New Testament church uh, symbolic language, not talking about literal adultery, not talking about those kind of things, but talking about symbolically in, in the things not being the way that the Spirit would have them to be. And that accounts for why this word of judgment is pronounced against them. Or is Jezebel's influence and consequence to be taken literally or of dangers that are more seditious? Is, is, there, is there nothing to be said about the fact that this is a, a, a female character from the Old Testament? And so it really has nothing to do with gender roles in church leadership or function or purpose in the kingdom of God, but that she's representative of sort of seditious dangers that, that creep into church life. And, you know, and, and, and all of these have, have a degree of merit that, that I can see. Because I know that historically... Churches that start off on the simple, simply living out the gospel, uh, a, a gathered body of people who are celebrating their faith, their shared faith and their belief in Scripture and their belief in salvation and, and grace and forgiveness and eternity, both heaven and hell and, and, and the role of, of, of Christ and the Spirit. And so a church life is very simple. They're, they're interested in celebrating what they share together, but at the same time, they're wanting to take it outside and bring others into that. And, and initially, that's a very simple form of doing things. You, 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 you get together and you worship however that's expressed, whether it's in poetry or in dance or in music. You have teaching or preaching of the Word. You, you, you facilitate things that, that somehow integrate children into the life of the church. You have purposeful outreach ministry to, to those that need it, both the saved and the unsaved. And, and somewhere along the way, you, you begin adding other things to that as though that were not enough. As though you have to do other things to appeal to people, to accommodate people. And, and could it be that this reference to Jezebel was about that, that subtle or seditious creeping in on, on those other things... That, that at first they were subsequent to, but then they became equal to the core values of the church, and at some time they superseded, such as when traditions drive the train rather than the simple teaching of the gospel. And so the question is, in terms of this ecclesiastical differential being unflinching, 
Where does the greater value lie in interpreting this passage? Simply saying it's a view of history and it really doesn't have things to say about the moment. It's just what is going to be. Or is there something more seditious in there? And, and my encouragement and how I would deal with churches, or I have dealt with churches. As a matter of fact, I've thought about going into a church that would ask and say, well, let's, let's just examine these seven churches together and, and see what truths we can, we can glean from that that might be relevant to you where you are in, in this moment and in this context. And to say, you know, are there things, and, and it's exactly what I would, it's the question I would ask. What are the things that the church is doing that are not clearly mandated in Scripture? Do you have practices? Do you have items that have become sacred items? Um, are there things that, that aren't clearly encouraged in Scripture to do? If, if they don't achieve the objectives that you think the church exists for, are there things that you're afraid of because to, to do those things is to threaten the practices or the beliefs or the, the values you've had in the past, and so you avoid those things that would be of benefit to you. But the truth is that an effective differential can't, it has to be unflinching in looking at what is true and what is not true about any given church. And then fourth, individual responsibility and response sh should, should be acknowledged. It really should be acknowledged in verses 24 through, through 29. We read these words. But I say to you, the rest who are at Thyatira. This is the word of encouragement because it says there are some who are caught up in this Jezebel, whatever that is. But there are the rest of you who are not who do not hold this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no other burden on you. It's, it's like Jesus is saying through John, if you're not guilty of those things, don't own your guilt of what other people are guilty of. It may be not what the church is promoting or encouraging. It's simply taking place within the body by some. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. He who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces, as I also have received authority from my Father, I will give him the morning star. This is a word of encouragement to those persons in a church where things aren't as they should be. They're not going well, and, and you're, you're examining yourself, and you're saying, well, listen, I'm, I'm reading the Word, I'm studying the Word, I'm, I'm seeking the voice of the Spirit, I'm, I'm seeking counsel of what my role and my part is. There are others that are doing things that are poisoning this environment that evidently God is frowning on, and, and the, the body as a whole is missing out on blessings that could be ours and should be ours. But I, I'm not supporting those things, and I'm not doing things, those things, and I'm wanting to do what is right, and, and the Spirit would say to you, you're commended for that. I'm not holding you responsible for what somebody else is doing that is wrong. And, and this is the real challenge. Uh, the guilt of the organization is not necessarily the guilt of the individuals. You know, now what has changed in over the course of human history and church history is that back in the days these letters were written, you'd have a community of a few hundred or a few thousand people. There would be one church. Birth there by people who came to faith. That was all they knew. And so if things went wrong in that body, it's not like you just go down the street and find another body of believers and, and become a part of that fellowship and, set, and put distance between you and the others. Nowadays, that's not the case. It's one of the reasons that accountability ha has, has disappeared in the church community. It's because if, if one local body of believers is wanting to hold people accountable to the, the tenets of Scripture and the teachings of Jesus and the integrity of the gospel and moral conduct and, I mean, and, and holiness and purity, and, and they really get serious about that. The person who's guilty that, that doesn't think they're guilty, they'll just simply take their toys and go to somebody else's sandbox and play there. And there are plenty down the street who say, we'll welcome you. We're not those kind of judgmental people. You're welcome here. Who are we to judge you and criticize you? As long as you say you love Jesus, we're just good with that. And they sweep everything away. 
And if you find yourself, you know, in one of those places where there are multiple options, you know, what is your calling and what should you do? The individual is still responsible for their response in that moment. I, I want to end on this note, uh, again, as a, as a student of, of church history, that when, um, when the pilgrims first came to, to this country, um, the, the Puritans who first came to this country, the Puritans were that group of people who felt like the Church of England had sort of lost its way. They wanted to stay within the good graces of the Church of England, but they called themselves Puritan because they thought that they could purify those things that were wrong. And so they stayed a part of that system. There was another group of people that were called separatists. They said, you know, the, the institution has got some flaws in its structure and its organization and its leadership, and you can't fix what is wrong in the expression of the church because those things will always continue to lead it back in the wrong direction. And so they separated themselves and, and said, well, you know, do what you want to do. We're, we're okay with that. You know, as, as a believer and as a church, you should have that freedom. We should have that same freedom. Just allow us to have that. It, they really wasn't granted to them because uh, the Church of England frowned on the separatists and, and condemned them and, and, and jailed many of them. And, but one of those who, who, was, who became a quite... Uh, the theologically educated was a main man by the name of Roger Williams. He came up in that, that Puritan sort of background, but he became convinced that there was a better way. Well, he came to, in the early part of the 17th century, he came to the, to the colonies. He came to Boston, which is like where everybody landed. And, um, and there he, he, he had opportunity to preach at a number of the churches, but he always found himself unsettled by the things that the church was doing. And he turned down an opportunity to pastor a church because it, it was strictly a Puritan church. And he didn't want to have to conform to those practices that still paid homage to the Church of England. And so when he would attend a church, he was so offended by some of the practices that they carried on. And he felt were not biblical at all. So when, for, for example, they would christen babies and they would call it baptism... You know, receiving these, these infants into the body of Christ as being forgiven and redeemed and, and, and believers. He would get up and he would face the back of the church building and it was his form of silent protest. He didn't condemn them. He didn't shout them down. He didn't point fingers. He didn't do any other kind of thing. He just simply said, this is my silent protest. Well, they got highly offended at that. And, uh, and they decided, well, you know, you, you, you need to... You need to do something else. And so he went down and he, he got a group of like-minded people and they, they began worshiping as a body of believers. There was such a fear of his sense of independence from the authority of the Church of England or even the Puritan brethren that the local authority, which was governed by you know, ecclesiastical influence, uh, condemned him for his practice and says, no, you can't stay here. You, you, you have to... You have to leave the colonies, but it's October, it's in the fall of the year, it's too late. So just keep quiet for now, and in the spring, we're going to ship you back to England. Well, that wasn't a good option for him because he knew that he went back to England, they would put him in jail. And so during the course of that winter, he didn't keep his mouth shut. He continued to preach and teach what he thought was true. And he had a friend that was connected to the, the political structure there who, who believed in him and loved him and respected him and sent word to him and says, listen, they're not going to wait until spring to do something. They're going to come and they're going to lock you up. And there's, there's the outside chance that you will be found guilty of heresy and you could lose your life. And the story goes that he, he put on his winter, his winter clothes, he stuffed his, his, his pockets with food, and he headed out into the wilderness. And, and that year is described as one of the most bitter and cold winters in New England history. And had not the, the, the Indians taken him in, matter of fact, later on he describes it, had not the ravens fed me, and that was a reference to the Indians. They took him in and, and nurtured him through the winter. And in the spring, he went someplace outside of the colony in what is now Rhode Island. He found a, a, a place there, a piece of land, and he purchased a piece of land. He had means and resources, and he bought land. And he says, we're going to say, this is outside of the, the, the colony and the providence. This is an independent state. I want this to be a place that anyone can come and find liberty of conscience to worship God as they choose. You don't have to do it my way. 
As a matter of fact, when he wrote the documents, the governing documents for, for that providence, he called the place Providence Roll Island because he felt the providence of God had led him there. He didn't incorporate any religious language into the, the civil code there because he wanted people to know that, that the civil authority wasn't being run by the church, that there were civil rules and regulations were, were, were true and equal for everyone who came there. And he wanted them to have the same liberty he sought to worship God in the way that he did. So Roger Williams was one of those that found himself in a place that could easily be said that there's a Jezebel problem here. First, he tried to silent protest and they tried to silence him by doing that, threatening him with, with life and, and jail and perhaps prosecution and execution. That, that he wasn't content just to sit on the sideline. He felt like he needed to take a stand. Try to get a group of people to go and, and do their own thing that didn't, didn't in, infringe on anyone else's practice and, and that wasn't good enough. And so he recognized that he had a responsibility based on his conviction to do something in that moment, in that time. And it meant going out in the wilderness at the risk of dying and, and trusting in the province of God to lead him to a place that he could do what God would have him to do. We end with these words as we always do. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. An ecclesiastical differential that's willing to look at the circumstance of any church and to say, here's what's right, here's what's good, but here's the poison among you that will lead to your death and your demise and it's up to you to make it right. If you're a person in a position of leadership in one of those churches, then the onus is on you to step back and say, let's, let's find somebody who can come in, outside eyes, upside eyes, to be honest with us about what they see and what we need to do to change. If you happen to be in one of those churches and you're not in a position of leadership, then you have to decide what the right thing for you to do is. Whether you can stay the course and pray that it changes or whether the Lord would lead you to one of those places that is willing to subject themselves to the critical eye of the Spirit and to say, what must I do to honor and to please you? Let me lead us in prayer. Father, I thank you for the difficulty of of working through these passages, um, because I think you would have a struggle with these things. So, so that we, we know that um, honesty and integrity and truth are, are not necessarily easy, easy, but they're necessary. If we're going to be a part of a body of believers that knows your blessing, to see you work through us in the lives of people around us, that we can be a place that's a refuge for for saints and, and, a, and a lighthouse for sinners and that we can do what you would have us to do that honors you and we could get the benefit of seeing your blessing around us and with us and through us. So Father, use those that participate in our journey together. Use these words to encourage them and their role and what they need to do. And we thank you for the privilege. It's in Jesus' name we pray and for his sake. Amen. Thank you once more for being a part of this journey with me. Continue to pray for us as we, we make our way. I'm trying to, to, to line up some more interviews with some pastors in the area. And, and that's just becoming really difficult. But pray as we make that happen because I know that there are things that they would share in context as a part of this that you wouldn't hear from me that would be beneficial to you and, and others. And then please invite others. You know, share this link with people, whether it's on YouTube um, or whether it's through Facebook or if you want the whole catalog and Vimeo, let me know and I'll share that with you. Uh, if you have questions or comments or criticisms, you know, you know, at least give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down when you watch this on whatever venue it is. And, and thank you for those who support the ministry uh, financially that make it possible for us to do the things that we do. And, uh, and if you'd like to do that, then you know, send me a, a note at this email address and I will help you learn how to do that. Or if you just like doing it old school, dropping a check in the mail, you can make, make it out to Church Rebirth Ministries Incorporated at this mailing address. And we will be glad. And it's a 501c3 organization. So at the end of the year, you'll get a statement of, of your contributions that you can use for purposes of taxes. Thank you for your encouragement, for your prayer, and for your support. I look forward to our time together every week. God bless you. <laughs> Just don't be a Jezebel.